Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today we are joined by Zach Bradford, CEO of CleanSpark. This podcast was produced in person at the recent Jackson Hole Ski Summit, so there's some ambiance and background noise in the show. Thanks to Amanda Cavallari for help in making these shows possible. Today we discuss CleanSpark's current financials, adding hash rate quickly, buying S19J Pro Pluses over S19XPs, stock compensation, and future growth plans outside the United States. Zach, welcome back to The Mining Pod. We're doing an in-person recording at the Ski Summit in Jackson Hole. We're inside the Jackson Hole Hostel for anyone listening. It's a little bit of a unique environment to record a podcast, but I'm digging it. And I'm uh, thankful that you're joining us today. You guys killed it in Q4, and there was a lot of preparation and planning over the last two years. Uh, and now we get to talk about those victories and then also look forward and talk about like some potential obstacles that are coming up that you guys are getting ready to, to tackle. Um, so again, thanks for joining. Hey, absolutely, Will. It's it's great to be here. I couldn't pick a better setting to do a live recording in. Yeah, seriously. Well, the Four Seasons was pretty nice as well. Uh, we could have done it there, but <laughs> full pricey for uh, the lowly mining pod. Okay, so we'll start off talking about Q4 Financial Sunset. Just came out yesterday for you guys. I'm thankful it did come out yesterday because we can actually talk about it. So according to some new research we did at uh, the Mining Memo, our newsletter that's adjacent to this podcast, we just took a look at your guys' current assets and current liabilities and did a ratio of that. It's 0.51. Um, that's compared to some other competitors that have a higher ratio and you want a higher ratio in order just to show like strength of the balance sheet. Um, so I want to get your thoughts on that ratio. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into it than just like current assets and current liabilities because you guys have so many different things going into this, right? Like there's cash flows, there's um, assets and liabilities that are future out in the, in the future. Um, so I want to get your thoughts on like your guys' current financial position though, based on what you guys just reported. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're actually really happy with where we're at. Um, you know, it's interesting, this business, um, you know, from a financial health point of view, having a lot of current assets to me indicates an idle asset. Um, our goal is to turn current assets into a long-term asset that produces cash flow in the form of Bitcoin. And so we do maintain fairly small cash balances, fairly small um, Bitcoin balances, but we're doing so because we're quickly transitioning cash into Bitcoin miners and infrastructure um, to produce more. So we, of course, are very conscious. We measure it every day. Um, we feel that we're absolutely not over our skis in at putting any risk on anything, but instead it's, you know, why have a huge cash balance if you're not doing something with it. And in this business, that matters a lot. Um, also because, you know, the market moves in ebbs and flows, um, and we're a proprietary miner, we can also choose the speed at which we deploy our capital. Um, we talk about it a lot, but for us, you know, a year ago when it was unpopular, we quit doing big future orders and instead transitioned to spot markets or like we did just recently, it was a direct, um, technically future order but it was a future order for delivery a month or two later. And so that's really what it is. We think just as important as managing capital, it's the timing of that capital and where it's put to use to quickly um, increase the balance of what we produce every month. What do you think about the current level of retail interest or knowledge of how miners are thinking about balance sheets? Because you guys are public and as much as you can comment on public interest in, in purchasing your guys' shares and things like that, I know there's some limits on the the, the language there but there does seem to be like very different strategies across miners and different levels of sophistication across the investors in these companies how do you as a ceo and as a brand position your guys to communicate that well to your to your investors you know what what we do is about effective use of capital um now if, if i'm can doing some compare and contrast you know what i would really say is you know any cash on a balance sheet that's not being put to use right away is cash that a shareholder likely put there through equity sales uh, for that company. And um, the longer that that cash sits there idle is the longer it's taking to produce a return on the shareholder investment. So um, fr from from our view, it's, it's about accessing equity capital because frankly, that's where marketing is. You know, the there, there was a lot of discussions today at the summit 
And I think that there's broad agreement that the debt markets are 18 months or more out. Um, obviously, we saw the problems that debt markets brought. And so you really have two main levers to pull from. One is Bitcoin and one is is equity. And and the first and foremost, we pull from our Bitcoin first. You know, in our update we just announced, we talked about how 17.9 million of our cash flows last month were produced from Bitcoin. And we're producing those at good margins. So those margins allow us to not only pay our bills, keep the lights on, but the first dollars that go to buying miners right now, the 20,000 we just announced, is from Bitcoin. And, and we think that that's the right way to do it. Use Bitcoin to get more Bitcoin. So, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're definitely not going to shy away from saying, yes, we do use equity. I think a lot of other players try to just not talk about it. Um, we use equity. Um, part of our focus is trust and transparency. And so we are open about what we do. And, but we also expect our shareholders to know and understand that we're doing it because we're taking that capital, we're immediately turning it into cash flow producing assets. Um, and we're doing so with assets that we believe produce the best ROI. And, and that's a focus on efficiency. There's a reason we chose the machines we chose. There's a reason that we own and operate our own facilities instead of host. Um, and we, we really think that the results are proving out. So. Um, if you want to judge us on, you know, uh, future performance, look to our past. And I think that it speaks for itself. So I was going to ask this question a little bit later in the conversation, but I think it is well positioned now. There was a recent headline about compensation for yourself and Matt, president, uh, ch president and chairman, right, of yeah. Clean's work. And I talked with Matt almost immediately afterwards because it's crypto Twitter. Like, <laughs> If you're listening to this, don't believe anything that you're hearing the first time and see it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was like, hey, Matt, let's just talk. And it's a good opportunity to get some FaceTime with him anyways. So um, he opened up and talked to me a little bit about it. And it was a great conversation. We did a little bit of a follow-up on the news version of the same podcast on Saturdays. I'm not ex expert in these things, however. So I want to throw it over to you and explain to me and like the audience like we're seven how the rsus and the options and the percentage of compensation worked for that period um and the rationale for that question of course is you guys are a, an equity play on a lot of your mining operations yeah. so people have considerations or questions about how you guys are deploying equity to yourselves yeah absolutely you know it's it's one of those things that uh, is tricky but let's just let's address it head on so the number that printed for my compensation was was 27 million right and if that's where you stop, you would have think that, you know, the board just awarded me a huge stack of cash. Um, but I would say that the first thing to do if for any public company is read the full disclosure. Um, I mentioned transparency. We went out of our way and we over disclosed. So for anybody that read, you know, the next three inches of the, our proxy filing, got the full breakdown of that. So the reality was, is, you know, my base compensation was 500,000. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with that and think it's great. And, you know, then there was a little bit of bonus, but the entire amount of cash that, that was captured was, you know, under a million dollars. And for our industry, I would point to any of our peers and say, you know, we, we compare really well. The key part in how a company is required to disclose this on a proxy when it comes to stock or options or anything like that is when the board approves or grants these, you have to report the entire value of that instrument, whether it vests, you know, immediately, whether it vests in three to five years, whether it's earned or not earned. Um, and that's the key to this. So at the, and this goes all the way back to, I think November of that would have been 2021, the board approved a package of stock and options for Matt, myself, and some other executives, of course, um, were, were the easy you know ones to, to point at because it was the biggest numbers. And the, the key thing is that is to focus on the alignment of those incentives. Um, first and foremost, you know, 50% of the RSUs that I was issued, they vest over a three-year period. If I'm not here in three years, the board gets sick of me, throws me out, you know, um, or they don't think I'm doing a good job, I'll never get those shares. But the full value of those shares was reported. Another thing that was in there is there was actually a double counting of, of some shares. When you 
modify the performance expectations around something, you have to report the full value uh, that it would have been and the full value for what it is going to be. So, and, and this number's off the top of my head, so it stands to correction, but I think the double counted number in my compensation was $8 million. And so, you know, you look at all these factors, you look at how the options work, you know, the year prior, the biggest part of my compensation, I think 80% of it was related to options that um, are exercisable at $23. Um, you know, our stock right now is floating between two and three. We're a long ways from 23. If it never gets to 23, I don't get any value. So let's, let's now talk about incentives. I'm now incentivized more than ever before to go take our stock above $23. Um, I'm also incentivized to perform. The other half of the, the stock was tied to hash rate. And, you know, let's, let's even talk about that because it's a little controversial. People say, hey, you know, why, why do you hash rate? Why don't you talk about pointing it towards, um, you know, uh, performance in revenue? Why don't you tie it to performance of the stock price? When we met as a team, what we did is we identified as a group, and this is the entire board, we sat down, myself, and we, we talked. What can we con control and what can we not control? And when you really boil down a Bitcoin mining company, we don't even control our revenue because we could set a revenue number and we could have actually done everything to get there and Bitcoin could have gone down. We actually saw that happen over the last year. You know, if, we, if, if we'd set milestones based on a $69,000 Bitcoin, we could have done everything right and missed it by, you know, 70% because of how Bitcoin performed. Um, on the same side, you know, the one thing we control is hash rate. And hash rate is what miners need to be focused on. Um, efficient hash rate, hash rate growing faster than difficulty grows, um, being well positioned at scale, because scale matters a lot when it comes to halving. The miners with scale and efficiency are gonna be ones that survive um, and thrive in, in the period after halving. And we've, we've got 13 months to get there, and so the board, you know, and us, we, we came up with a plan. I presented to the board about where we were going to get and how we were going to grow. And the board said, great, let's go out and let's get it done. Let's prove it. And we're going to tie your compensation to that growth. So that's what they did. They gave me um, shares, that, or RSUs in this case, that vest on a timeline based upon what I told the board I was going to do. That's how they're holding me accountable. And if I don't get there, then I don't get the shares. Regardless of that, the full value's in there. So we've got some double counter shares and all the shares that I'll probably get over the next three years were reported in a lump sum. So the interesting thing to point to is if you were to take the number that's gonna get reported this year to a number that gets reported next year, when the shares actually vest, when value's actually transferred, you're gonna see a substantially smaller number. Um, my opinion, it's just, you know, the rules could probably work better to actually give true like to show the transfer of value, which is what it, they should show. Um, but the rules aren't written that way. The rules are written so you post the full value of the shares, whether they're earned or not. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah, I think that the funny thing is, and this goes back to my earlier question, is it's so hard to communicate to retail investors or anyone who's just like passively putting a mining stock into their portfolio, the expectations for a mining company, because it's a completely different industry. Uh, but you teed up the next question, very well, just like you did that one. Let's talk about the 9.4 exahash guidance that you guys are trying to get online this year for a total of 16, I believe is the number you guys are, are reaching for. Um, you guys have this at the market to be approved still. You guys are still working on uh, purchasing new deployments. Believe most of your facilities are purchased at this point, unless there's more I don't know about. And if you want to leak anything, feel free. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I threw some some thoughts your way right there. Tell me a little bit about what that looks like this next year. So, um, you know, the to get to 16, we, we have everything pretty much in place. Um, so we're going to get there be through, we're doing a 50 megawatt expansion in the city of Washington, Georgia. And that's going really well. You know, it's on track. We've been posting some pictures of that. Um, and, you know, that should be online right around the, the last latter part of June, hopefully a little earlier if we can get there, but you know, we, we've guided to the end of June. And um, 20,000 machines to fill it up, we've already ordered. They're on their way. They'll be here actually in advance of the, the power coming online. And so that will get us to a little over nine exahash by the time everything goes online there. 
So that leaves us obviously with with about seven to get there. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we, we bought a site in. Um, I said Washington earlier. I meant Sandersville actually. So um, Washington's our fifty megawatt build out. Sandersville is our hundred and fifty megawatt build out. And so the the fifty megawatts in Washington's going really well. Sandersville, we're in the process of building that out. 150 megawatts, it'll house a little over 45,000 uh, miners, and that will give us the delta in the gap um, to get to 16. We're, we're likely to, you know, and we've, we've said this publicly, we're going to be adding a little more uh, hash rate, a little more juice to some of our other sites by bringing in some, uh, you know, we're always trying to improve efficiency, some a little more efficient miners that are going to be coming online there. So we have everything in hand to get there. Right now, our biggest risk is really, from a execution point of view, is the Sandersville 150 megawatt site. That's obviously a really big build, and um, a lot of pieces to come together. Right now, everything's on track. We should be set to go online in November, and um, our goal is to have it all come online all at once. So it'll be a pretty big, you know, jump at the end of the year. We haven't started quite breaking grounds um, on that one yet. Um, we have plenty of time, obviously, to get it done. We're likely going to take the same design that we're doing right now in Washington, 50 megawatts, replicate it out three times over. So we're we're really excited about that. We'll be, you know, obviously those are the machines left to still be purchased. Uh, we have some exciting things going on, line of sight on, on what that is, and, and look forward to it. Now, b- back to the first part of your question, obviously, with, with the ATM. So when, when we filed... The ATM, we obviously, it took about three filings to, you know, get all of our ducks in a row on that. We're still able to have access to the, base, essentially the prior ATM um, w- without overcomplicating it, which form and all this stuff. So we're, we've been enabled to continue to use the ATM. We're also pending, you know, basically the new one, which is a replacement. So there won't be two ATMs when the next one gets approved. It all just comes together and we, we move forward from there. So we replaced the old one with a $500 million um, ATM. And, and that is where we you know see outside of the Bitcoin we sell, we see a large amount of the capital coming from there. And we, we think it's the right way heading into halving where there's a, a lot of you know execution risk and things that will be facing miners. Faced with a healthy balance sheet is, is absolutely where we want to be and um, really look forward to the growth we have ahead of us. One thing that caught my eye in your recent press release, which actually came out the day before we recorded this, uh, was your guys' facility strategy. I think it was a quote from you, um, if I'm mistaken, apologies, but talking about like how you guys have multiple different facilities that are large in scope, and that's compared to Riot, which has like one massive facility, and they're working on a second massive facility, uh, compared to Marathon, which is now using like multiple hosting providers and has been. Um, it's just a different facility strategy. Tell me a little bit about that and tell the listeners a little bit about that, how you guys think about the facility strategy. You're, you're mostly located in the state of Georgia, but you guys do have that flexibility in the fact that, hey, I have 50 megawatts here, I have 150 megawatts here, if something happens, I'm able to be flexible or dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, we, we've always shied away from any sort of super sites. Now, obviously, when Sanders fills down, it'll be 230 megawatts. That's That's a pretty big site. And it's likely that'll be our biggest, you know, we, we will probably want to keep them some sort of underneath those numbers or around those numbers, but the ability to move into communities and, you know, from a workforce point of view, from an, uh, you know, a value proposition point of view, we, that that's what we're seeing is, is kind of all of our sites really are in smaller communities, uh, in Georgia for the most part. And with that, you know, comes walking in the front door educating a community, bringing value to the community. You know, Washington in particular is a small town. Most of the industries moved out and we're now a significant employer. We're also, I believe, one of the largest revenue generators for that city. They are the utility provider through the Municipal Energy Authority of Georgia. Um, and as part of that, it's, it's really meaningful. And so it creates a great way to collaborate and you know, not being too big or too small for these communities matters. Um, but again, if, if something happens, right, um, you know, heaven forbid, but let's just think about how the world works sometimes is you get a tornado. Tornado rolls through. If it rolled through and it wrecked one of our sites, we would have multiple other sites to go to. 
And that's how we're going to pursue our strategy always going forward is we're going to have multiple sites so that if anything catastrophic happens or, you know, if a substation goes down for two months for some unknown reason, it's not going to kill the whole operation. And, and that's something that, you know, a traditional data center thinks about. They think about it in redundancies. You know, they have two substations from different places coming in. As Bitcoin miners, we're using so much power that that's really not economically feasible to have these redundant lines coming from different places. So you usually end up with a single source feeding a site. So the way to protect in redundancies is to have different geographic locations. Um, you know, on a long-term perspective, we really like Georgia. We're going to continue to build in Georgia. Um, we really think we understand the market. And there's something that matters from an uh, expertise point of view. Every utility is different. Every state law is different. So it's, it's hard to navigate. But on a long-term basis, we will expand outside of Georgia because that is also part of our strategy is to not be stuck with a state that can change a law, have a utility change, whatever it may be. Um, although I think we picked a great state that has very low risks. You know, it's a very business-friendly state. It's also a state from a power point of view. They're building nuclear power plants actively. And, um, you know, they're really exporting power to other states. So for them to be able to utilize power inside their state lines is something they're looking to do. And it allows them to monetize it, you know, pay taxes. Um, you know, the sales tax on our power bills has become one of the number one funding mechanisms for schools in these small communities. So I really like where we're at, but again, separating even a little bit of separation an hour or two goes a long way so you've mentioned two things i want to pick up on one is the efficiency which kind of goes into units uh as opposed to facilities but it does bleed into facilities as well and then the long-term planning in georgia um but we'll start with the first one and you can pick this up and move into units if you want to but uh facilities having the redundancies of locations some people think that decreases your efficiency because you have to have um parts for this facility and parts for this facility. I need a forklift for here and a forklift for here. Uh, I need techies at this site and at this site. How do you think about it from an efficiency standpoint, which you guys have really been beating that drum over and over again, if you guys are going to pursue building multiple sites? What, what we found is from a tech point of view, you need the same number of techs, really a, you know, a full-time employee per megawatt, whether you have a 200 megawatt site or a 20 megawatt site if you want to have high uptime and efficiency. So really on the tech side, you're losing nothing. So I think that that's kind of a, something that can get confusing, but you know, a megawatt of machines running in one place is the same as a megawatt, you know, a bunch of machines in buildings next to each other. And so we really staff that way. We do centrally manage the, the company. So there's still, you know, a, a, a knock, a headquarters that really everything rolls back to gets managed. So it's not like we have things beyond the site managers. We don't have this big bulky system that needs to exist at every single site. You know, it's, it's all central. And the great thing about working in this digital economy is, you know, our headquarters are in Las Vegas. We have 30 of our approximately 125 employees there. And they can manage all the accounting, all the legal, all the finance, all the what I call the administrative functions of a business at a single location. Because at the end of the day, the Bitcoin gets, you know, all of our hash rate pushes up into a pool and the pool is ultimately what produces the Bitcoin. It doesn't matter where, where in the country that is. So from a management point of view, um, that's how we see it. So from a headcount, which is a long-term cost, of course, I don't lose much sleep about a forklift, you know, a forklift here, a forklift there. If, if this industry's margins are so squeezed that, uh, you know, an extra forklift causes an issue, then, uh, then we've got bigger problems. So, um, you know, because you're really talking about four forklifts. So, and again, if I had a really big site, um, which we're even talking about at our Sandersville site, it gets so time consuming to move something from point A to point B across, you know, multiple acres of site. You probably buy a second forklift there anyway. And so from an efficiency point of view, human capital and kind of the basics, highly, highly efficient. You know, really from a machine point of view is what, what we also focus on. So, you know, in our most recent announcement, we talk about how our fleet efficiency has improved. Um, part of that from, you know, basically retiring and, and moving on and selling from old machines into new machines, but also just by always buying incrementally better machines has allowed us from December to be at 31.6 watts per terahash. 
um, all the way down to 30.6. And, and that matters. And I think a lot of people miss that that matters a lot. So if you look at all the miners and, you know, the public miners that have posted it, you know, there's miners as high as 44 watts of terra hash and 40 watts of terra hash. And going into halving, being on the bottom half of efficiency from a watts converting to terra hash is going to matter a lot. You know, what what we hear a lot is that the worldwide fleet efficiency is right around 45. So public miners in general are usually on, on the right side of that. But um, really at scale, that's going to matter a lot more. Um, and there's a lot of ways to buy more efficient machines. And the next thing to pay attention to that is uh, how efficiently is the capital being used from a dollar to producing a Bitcoin point of view. There's a reason we didn't just buy 20,000 XPs. Um, we like the XPs. We have several thousand of them, but we made a choice to buy the J Pro Pluses, which come in at an incrementally better hash rate, you know, at 27.5 instead of 29.5. There's a big gap between 21.5 and 27, but there's an even bigger gap in the payback of an XP. You know, right now, XPs are selling in the low 30s. And, you know, we will have acquired these after it's all said and done in the 13s. And so we can get, you know, a sub one year payback off of the machines we just bought, whereas it would take over two years on the XPs. And the big problem with that is once you cross halving, all bets are off on the economics. And if you're betting on the second, ha second year of that purchase to make the difference, you, you could find yourself caught out in the wrong place. Why do you think your competitors and we don't have to name names, but why do you think your competitors are still in this XP market? They're, they're still pushing for it, they're still purchasing it, as opposed to these other units, which don't have as much hash rate, but you know, for your point, the economics make more sense. Yeah, they make a lot more sense. And again, 122 tera hash as opposed to, you know, 140 to 134. I think it's because and and this is, you know, at the core of how I lead the company, which is strategy over ideology. Um, there's a lot of ideology in the Bitcoin space. And with that I ideology comes name recognition. It comes kind of being flashy sometimes. And I think the XPs, it's really easy to say, we bought the best machine. You go buy the XP. Ignore what it cost us. Ignore the timelines it takes us to deploy the machines. Ignore how long a out in advance we had to put the capital before we even received the machine to plug in. And I think that that, ROI is what the, is fundamentally what investors need to pay more attention to that they're not. But I think it's also it's the easy camp. I'm gonna I'm just gonna say it. it the easy thing to do for us would have been to buy a bunch of XPs, um, but it wasn't the right thing. And we will buy XPs, and we have even in the last you know quarter or two bought XPs. But we're gonna buy them um, at small scale, a few batches here, a few batches there, until the ROI comes together. You have a machine that is, you know, 30 to 40% more efficient. It should cost 30 to 40% more. Instead, it's costing up to 300 times more. And so I believe, I do believe that as this year goes by, we're going to start to see the value propositions converge. But as long as there's this glut of the J pros in general, just out in the market, it's going to be harder to get there. But when, when they do converge, you will see us start to shift more to XPs, but it, it hasn't happened yet. And until it does, we think it's the right move. And, you know, even from an efficiency point of view, there are things you can do with a J Pro that you can't yet do with an XP from a technology point of view. I'm going to point to something that sometimes is unpopular to talk about, but I think is something that's important to understand whether a company can or can't do it as they move into halving because nobody knows what the economics are going to be, and that is underclocking. We, we, all of us talk about overclocking. We overclock machines currently when the economics makes sense. But will machines have the ability to be underclocked come um, halving? And, you know, it's unproven on the XPs. And there's a little bit you can do, but it's not nearly the levels of efficiency. And something else you can do with the J-Pro that we have tested and proven out ourselves is you can basically take a J Pro and turn it into a mini XP within a few, you know, watts per tera hash. And so, yes, it produces less hash rate, but it does so just as efficiently. So, again, this is where scale matters. Somebody 
like us, we would expect to have, you know, 16 or more exahash. And if I have to crank down a few machines to, you know, 14 and a half, but I now have the same efficiency as an XP, and I paid one third as much for that machine, then the economics have already proved out for us. So that's really how we're seeing it is how flexible are these machines? And the XPs have proven not to be as flexible. And until somebody kind of cracks that code to bring the flexibility into them, and, and at that time, we will look into them harder. And there are a lot of machines that are available to be bought, both JPros and XPs. It just doesn't make ROI sense, we don't believe, at this point in time. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to take an interest in what you had to say there. So let's finish up with a few thoughts. Um, going back to the Georgia point you made earlier about how you guys are going to probably pursue Bitcoin mining outside of Georgia, depending on the situation with the mining market. A recent tagline that I've seen, and I don't know how recent this is, but I believe it is pretty recent, is you guys are America's Bitcoin miner. Yes. Right. Within that same is like somewhat self-limiting in the fact that America only has so much cheap energy and competitors are more and more looking outside the U.S. How do you guys think about outside the U.S.? How do you guys think about building in the U.S.? Um, is that tagline more indicative of potential pressure from like regulatory groups? Um, is it just something from like a branding perspective in terms of getting brand awareness? Um, yeah, a few questions I lobbed your way, but just curious about that. Yeah, you know, we we approached it from the point of view we we think we're America's Bitcoin miner and amongst the best at doing it, and and we we do so not only you know inside the U.S. but obviously we and and I, the differentiator again is we own, we operate, we do everything with our own infrastructure. Do we think that'll be long term self limiting? No, because again, strategy over ideology. We do see North and South America as interesting opportunities. Um, they're also, which would include, of course, Canada, it would include all of South America, Latin America. We, we think that that would still prove to be a true statement. There's interesting things going on, you know, overseas. Obviously, the European power markets, we don't think will stand up long term to the way they regulate it. Obviously, we all have firsthand experience and visibility now on how the energy crisis with the war, war with, between Russia and Ukraine has transpired. And so... We see Europe is too risky. There's obviously interesting things that other miners are doing in the Middle East. One thing to point out is you just you, you just pointed out that, hey, what about having different sites and lacking some efficiencies? As soon as you have to do cross-border taxation, there's a cost to that. And so we are very interested in international, but we are also very interested in approaching it slowly. And it would need to be an opportunity that was worth that exchange of cost to be having this now international structure. You have cross-border taxation. You have, now you have different laws and licenses and things you have to deal with. We understand Georgia really well. And I think, again, having a specialty in an area allows you to be better in that area than somebody else could be that walked in tomorrow. So no, we, we don't think it'll be limiting. Just to be direct, we would, of course, look to North and South America anyway. We would still be the Americas at that point, uh, you know, Bitcoin miner. But we also don't think that, you know, there's really cool things going on in Paraguay. There's really cool things going on in Argentina. And, you know, Brazil may be, you know, close on the tail of that. But from a re regulatory regime point of view, it's we, we see it as high risk. And we really think that, the, to be the best stewards of our capital, deploy that in a known environment um, here in the U.S. is the way to do it. Love that. Okay, let's finish up reflecting on your guys' Q4. I, I'm blanking on the numbers, even though I had them up earlier. Um, the amount of hash rate you guys deployed in Q4, just explosive growth. You guys sort of set the table or the benchmark for what a Bitcoin miner should be doing during a bear market. Any reflections on what the last three to six months have been like for yourself and for the team that you're stewarding? Yeah. You know, it, it shows that really two things. One, um, being bold matters and also having grit. You know, grit is something that we champion as an internal culture, hard work, not shying away from, you know, tough situations, um, having courage to grow when everybody says it's the time to stop growing and also to do so smartly. That's, that's really what it came down to is 
when everybody says to do something one way, it's probably time to look and do the other. So when everybody said, hold all your Bitcoin forever was the same time that we were told to prepay, you know, the way to get XPs was to prepay a hundred million dollars, 12 months in advance. We actually saw that as a market signal that, and you know, last, I, that would have been a year ago, November, we, we told the market, hey, we're going to start using our Bitcoin. We're going to use Bitcoin to make more Bitcoin. Same thing that we saw in the growth. When everybody buckled down, it was because of the decisions they made. They got into too much debt. They didn't use their Bitcoin until it was worth a third of what it had been a year ago. And it created great opportunities for us. And so it's just being prepared for the opportunities. And we're going to continue to be prepared for those. You know, I, I love M&A. You know, we've, we've done a lot of acquisitions in the last while. They've all worked out really well. We also learned something from every single time we've done it. Um, you have to have a team and a culture that's going to mesh. And we, we've said no. I think that that's something that not everybody gets to see, of course. We've said no far more than we've said yes. You know, as much as we're seen as the aggressive acquirers and we, you know, grew a huge amount of hash rate over last year. I think from January to January, our hash rate grew 228%. And we're going to continue on the path. You know, it, it, December of this year, we were at six point, we're a little over six, and we're going to get 16 by the end of this year. So that means we're going to more than double again in, in what we do. So that's, that, that's, that's really what, what we're going to go out and do. We're going to keep being bold. Um, we have one of the best teams in the industry, I think. I'd put them up against anybody else. Um, I think our uptime is exactly where it needs to be. So between uptime, efficiency, and the best team that's out there, we're, we're going to go out and keep getting it done. Love that, Zach. Thank you so much for your time and happy trails on the, on the ski slopes. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.